Welcome back to Next Gen Console Watch, our show following all the news and goings-ons with the PlayStation 5 and Xbox Series X. I'm Damon Hadfield, and as always, I'm joined by Jonathan Dornbush, host of iGen's PlayStation podcast, Podcast Beyond. Beyond. Hey, Damon. Hello there. And Ryan McCaffrey, host of iGen's Xbox podcast, Podcast Unlocked. Damon, are you, do you just have like a photographic memory where you remember which one of us you introduced first the week before? Because you are like flawless in alternating <laughs> well, it. Or do you actually go and check the previous week's show? No, I, actually what I do is uh, whatever our lead topic, if it leans more towards PlayStation or Xbox, that's the one I try to introduce first. Ah, and that's why behind the curtain. Yeah. That's why I went with Jonathan this week, because this week we got confirmation that PlayStation's subscription service is real. Project Spartacus. We've been covering the rumors uh, the, over the past couple months. This week, Sony confirmed it is real. It basically consolidates PlayStation Plus and PlayStation Now into one subscription service that has three tiers. There's an essential, extra, and premium tier. They go for $10, $15, and $18 a month, although there is a a yearly plan that you can get on. Now, if you uh, are existing PlayStation Plus customer and you don't do anything, you're just going to become a PlayStation Plus essential customer and nothing changes for you. You still get a free couple games a month and uh, access to cloud, cloud saves. But the higher tiers provide access to a, a wider catalog of both PlayStation 5 and PS4 games, and the premium tier offers some back catalog choices going back PS3, PS2, and all the way to PS1. Right off the bat, is this change to the existing PlayStation Plus and PlayStation Now services, in your eyes, good for PlayStation fans? It is yes and no. Uh, unfortunately, it's not an easy answer, but I think, you know, I, it's something that I've been calling for and I think we have on Podcast Beyond for years. Uh, when you see the gap in PlayStation Plus subscription, it's at about, I think, 48 million or so right now and PlayStation Now, which is at a little over 3 million uh, and hasn't moved quite as much as PS Plus. Clearly, Now was not getting the focus or the attention that it maybe could. And we've kind of always been pushing for it to just be a part of PlayStation Plus. And this essentially does that. It splits it up into a few interesting tiers, and I think we can get into kind of some of the benefits and detractions of that stuff. But I think it is a potentially good option. The thing is, we just don't have the full information. The The thing that I think is really going to be make or break for people is what the libraries are going to be. We know that the middle tier, uh, I, I hate the naming, but we know the middle tier, which is called Extra, will have the PS4 and PS5 games, and then the, the premium tier will have PS1, PS2, PS3, and PSP. But we don't know what That's games. Right. We know a few hundred will be added at each tier, 400 for the middle, another 340 mm-hmm. or so for the, the final. That's a lot of games. But it's going to matter what those games are, how many, how often new games are added, what's taken out. You know, there's a lot there that I think is going to define what people are going to actually be excited for, and we just won't know that until we're closer. Well, Ryan, Xbox Game Pass has been a huge success. Uh, you know, how many times in the past two or three years have the words "best deal in gaming" been printed onto the internet referring to Xbox Game Pass? With the the new PlayStation Plus subscription service, Ryan, do you think Xbox should be worried? No, I mean it's it's good to have more choices. I mean, I've uh, I've had I'm probably just going to leave my PlayStation Plus base subscription as is. I don't think I'll be upgrading it at all. And uh, I, I think multi platform gamers will probably pick one or the other in terms of as far as the the upper tier premium stuff. Whether you're going to do Game Pass and Essential or uh, the the higher tier mm-hmm. PlayStation Plus and maybe the the, the base ten dollar a month Game Pass. Or no Game Pass at all. I, I don't think there'll be a lot of the Venn diagram overlap will be very high between like both of the highest tiers on this because while there's some overlap, I mean it's there, there's they're they're really targeting a couple different things. I, I mean it's there's still no day one first party releases on this, correct? Mm-hmm. On the on the mm-hmm. PlayStation side, that's right. Yeah, and that's and that's been a big uh, factor, or at least an ever growing important factor for Xbox because. You know, let's be honest, when Game Pass launched several, I guess it's going to be about five years ago now coming up, they Microsoft made that promise, but there weren't any first party games to really get excited about launching into the service. Now that's actually been changing. Obviously, last fall was, well, really the back half of last year was just crazy with, with Forza Horizon 5, IGN's Game of the Year for 2021, and, and Halo Infinite, and uh, Psychonauts 2, Flight Simulator. It was a really impressive uh, showing for not just Microsoft itself and Xbox, but but for Game Pass. And so, you know, that's 
But Microsoft's had to do that. They've they've they have to try and get people into their ecosystem because uh, Sony's been such a dominant number one for the last you know generation plus. Whereas Sony is is sitting pretty with with their just incredible first party lineup that's been just getting it done, pumping out you know nines and tens uh, for years now. And so they, at least for now, I think can get away with not necessarily uh, bundling in their first party games on day one to this, but I think there will come a point where I think they will have to eventually. But for now, yeah, it's uh, they're, they're pretty different services, really. Yeah, that's an interesting point, Jonathan. <clears throat> the fact that the first party PlayStation games won't be launching day one into the service. Um, you know, I, I totally understand that uh, those exclusives, those first party exclusives are the whole prestige, the whole uh, appeal behind uh, Sony and, and the whole reason it's developed such a, a reputation as it has, but without it, if it doesn't need to have those those first party games in there, it's almost like what well, what is what is the impetus behind this whole thing, right? It's like if Microsoft needed to do something like this to yeah. get people back into its ecosystem, but PlayStation doesn't really need something like this to get people into its ecosystem. It's, it almost makes you wonder what's the real what's the real, real goal here. Well, I, I don't think they needed this at the moment to get people into the ecosystem, but to, you know, to Ryan's point. We'll see where things continue to shake out over this generation. I think it's going to be a much closer gen in terms of sales of hardware than last generation was. But I, I think the reason they're doing it is is a couple fold, and, and obviously this is just conjecture, but one, again, a branding issue. PlayStation Now has been around for so long and so few people use it. And it's just kind of been sitting there. And and to have PlayStation Plus, which is tenfold more successful, if not more so, is, you know, there's a clear problem with just keeping PlayStation now hanging around. But there is obviously a dedicated user base because that three million has been around for, for some time. So I think, one, it helps solve sort of that conundrum, even though, the, again, I don't like the tier naming. I don't think it's well put together. Mm -hmm. uh, they had silver, bronze, silver, and gold trophies to work with right there. They could have just named it after that. But I think it's partially that. I think it is also, you know, some of some of the context I think is important is the reason we got this announcement the way we did. Uh, this came out on March 29th when they first announced it. The end of the fiscal year is March 31st. They didn't tell us the library, the thing that is going to get people to actually buy this thing and subscribe to it, but they did tell us about it because they can then present this to shareholders as a new revenue opportunity. I mean, like to Microsoft credit, Game Pass has made everyone say, okay, we need subscription services and games as well. I, you know, it's not just stuff like Fortnite and, and Apex Legends or things that do battle passes. We saw GTA Plus get announced in the last week. Like subscription mm -hmm. services have become a, a, a such a big part of the sector now. And so if you can tell your investors, oh, hey, this is a new evolved form of what we've been doing and we're, we're improving it and we're building on it, that looks appealing to people who, you know, pay the money to make your company happen. So I think that is also part of the impetus is, is it's something they can't ignore. But, you know, to the point of first parties uh, not being a part of it, Jim Ryan in an interview, whether you believe him or not, obviously, I know some people have, have talked about whether or not this is true or whether there could be changes to the business. But he essentially said, we don't believe that we could take away the money that's made revenue wise as the as a result of the sales of those games to be able to produce <clears throat> them on the scale and the quality level that we're doing. And, and whether or not that's true, it's, it's sort of a chicken and egg thing, because unless they try, we can't really know. Um, mm -hmm. so, you know, we, for now, I don't think we are going to anytime soon see day one launches. We are seeing stuff as recent as last year, like Returnal, uh, coming to the collection when it launches in June. And that's really cool. But yeah, I don't think we're going to see it anytime soon. But to Ryan's point, I think we could see it as the landscape continues to change. I think we'll see it if Sony feels like they need to add that. And I think for now, uh, there, these are, these two services are, are targeting different gamers. I mean. This new PlayStation Plus service seems to be pretty hyper targeted at the hardcore longtime PlayStation gamer because what are they doing? They're effectively monetizing backwards compatibility. They're using yep. the back catalog to say, hey, you want to come, you know, revisit some good old memories? Come on in here. Whereas on the Xbox side, all that stuff's free. I mean, the, the back catalog doesn't go back as far because Xbox hasn't been around as long as PlayStation, but. By throwing in all the first party stuff and trying to get these big third party gets, like we've seen MLB The Show, we've seen uh, Back for Blood, uh, we've seen Outriders and a number of others. Microsoft's, you know, they 
the diehard Xbox fans have been there through the, the lean times. They're mm-hmm. trying to reach out and get uh, new people, get, you know, get people either to, to come over from PlayStation or, or, you know, become multi-platform gamers or bring in new customers. Whereas this, this PlayStation plus uh, move here, just fe- it feels, and I'm not, I'm not placing a judgment on it. I just oh, think sure. it seems like it's, it does seem to be like focused on really uh, targeting the, the core PlayStation gamer that just eats, sleeps and breathes PlayStation. No, totally. I mean, to your point, the the middle tier is where the PS4 and 5 library comes, which is presumably the most attractive to incoming players, which I think makes sense that it's at the cheaper tier. You can get uh, a year of that for, I believe, $100, which is, you know, cheaper than a year of Game Pass Ultimate if you're just yeah. subscribing. I like the, the annual level. option. I wish Microsoft would do that. It mm-hmm. It is a really great thing. Again, it's going to matter what the library is. If the library is not good, then that money is not worth it. But, you know, to your point of really going for the dedicated audience, I think that's the reason you see the older games at that higher tier, because that I think that appeals to a more narrow group. But that group really cares about that. And so they're probably going to pay a little bit more money. Unfortunately, Mm -hmm. it does probably mean I've seen a lot of people asking. We don't have an official answer, but I would I would bet it's the case. A lot of people have hoped, you know, I bought PS1 and PS2 classics on my PS3 or my Vita. Am I going to be able to play those because I owned them? Probably Mm -hmm. not, unfortunately, at which is just not a good thing. It sucks that that is the case right now, that that backward compatibility is gated behind a subscription in that way. You know, but that is why they know, I think they, they can play to that audience to make a little more money. I, uh, you know, Justin or uh, Jonathan, you mentioned that uh, you expect this generation uh, it, it, in all, it, it, it's possible that the sales of both platforms could be a lot closer than they were last gen. And I do think it's true. It's much more, it's become much more common recently for gamers to own both consoles because even if they were a, a, a long time PlayStation fan, the Xbox Game Pass was just such an appealing proposition that they could have their PlayStation for all their exclusives and then they could have their secondary console for Game Pass, which is their Netflix for gaming. That, and that's me. I have, a, I have an Xbox, I have both platforms and I subscribe to both PlayStation Plus and Game Pass. Sorry, my cat's being very cuddly right now. But uh, so do I want to pay more on for a, the, this extra PlayStation Plus service that does not get me the first party games. The, I, I just feel like, would you agree that it's quite quite possible that if you're already in Xbox Game Pass, a lot of people may not feel like they need a, a second one that doesn't get them Sony's first party games, right? Oh, absolutely. Like, it, you know, to Ryan's point, it, it took a while, but between last fall with Halo and, and Forza back to back, and, you know, even if the beginning of 2022 has been quiet, we know of 10 plus games coming down the line that will be really exciting for Game Pass subscribers. And so that that benefit, if those games appeal to you, is just inherently worth that money. Because even if you're spending 180 a year, if they put out four games, you've already saved 60 bucks. So that just makes sense. I think, again, it's really going to come down to the games that they put in this library and how often they're updated. And if they go after day one exclusives in the way that uh, Microsoft has from third parties, if if we don't see any third parties from, you know, a Square Enix or a Capcom or something like that, debut day and date, PlayStation has tried to slowly start, it seems, getting back into a place of focusing on indies, uh, though that's obviously been somewhat contentious. If they really want to do that, putting very cool indies day one like xbox recently did with tunic on game pass can be a big deal as as a reason for people to go to it um so it's you know it 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 seems silly it it doesn't give an exact answer but it really i think is going to depend how they support the system with those third-party exclusives the volume of them and the 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 sort of pace at which they're added and ryan with 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 sony outright saying basically we couldn't afford to put our our, our first party games day one into the service, our first party games that sell tens of millions of copies couldn't afford to lose all that revenue. This is something that's been brought up before and I know Phil has addressed it, but once again, Ryan, does it give you any ca- cause for concern that Xbox's model isn't sustainable? How, what was the last known number that we knew of for Game Pass subscriptions, which I think is pretty old. I mean, it was, was it 20 million, something like that? I don't, I don't even remember. Yeah, I, let's, just, let's just say 20 million for the sake of argument. And let's say, let's say no one is paying 15 for Ultimate. Let's be like hyper conservative. Let's <laughs> say it's 10 bucks a month. So what is that? That's like, what is that? 200 million bucks a month? That's, uh, sure, I guess that's, uh, that's one yeah. AAA game a month that they so can afford. To- 200 million. And, and what did, let's say, you know, we know Halo Infinite was 
it went through a lot. It was a six year development cycle. Let's say that game cost four hundred million dollars to make, which it may very well have uh, because, I mean, it went on for a long time, had a massive team, you know, the marketing, all that stuff. So guess what? You've just you've just paid for Halo Infinite's whole budget in two months of, uh, sure. of, of subscription time. So, you know, and again, we just played that with ridiculously conservative numbers. The, the average subscription price is obviously higher than 10 bucks a month. And the subscription counts probably higher than 20 million. I believe it's so, at uh, 25. As thank you. The yeah, beginning. there you go. Yeah. Thank you, Jonathan. And uh, once a newsman, always a newsman, Jonathan. I'm ready, ready <laughs> no, I just mean five. 25 people. It actually really. <laughs> no, yeah. 25 million, but, um, I believe, as of this January. But yeah, so it's 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 a lot. You have to play the long game with it. You can't just do this overnight. And Microsoft has has done that. I mean, let's all for a little perspective, go back to 2017 when Game Pass was first coming onto the scene. It wasn't a thing that anybody really believed in in the in outside of Microsoft, like in the in the community. It was like, OK, well, you guys don't have any first party games. And well, there's so so there's some like some old stuff. I mean, the, the analogy to early Netflix was pretty apt. Uh, in fact, mm. you know, it's still the case, right? Like Netflix today is this ubiquitous, like practical must have entertainment service. Mm. And Game Pass has become the same thing in gaming. Like, it's just like, how can you not? subscribe to this or at least if you don't it's like you you definitely don't argue with the value of it so it just yeah it takes time and sony is they are at the they are at the point now with their you know their this new revision to playstation plus that microsoft was in 2017 they're at the beginning of the journey the the difference is that everyone is now conditioned to expect what game pass delivers and so that's that's not helping sony's case but uh, that, and that's why I think over time, uh, falling back to the beginning of our conversation, I think in time they're they're gonna have to put and and whether they can afford to or I mean I think they certainly can. They're gonna put the first party games on there eventually. Uh, mm-hmm. It just seems like they're gonna ride out this whole like get, getting seventy dollars per copy from from all the games as long as they can. And I don't blame them for that. They're making great games that PlayStation fans want. So. From a business sense, I understand it, but I do think if in time, uh, it is inevitable that their first party titles will go day and date into, you know, presumably the top tier of PlayStation Plus. Jonathan, would you agree? I, I think it is, if not an inevitability, an extreme likelihood at some point, yes. And if not everything, at least a, a good chunk of them. Um, it, it It's something that I think the the value of that is really going to depend on. And, and I I don't I think this is likely, but it's going to depend on the volume increase and the output of quality that we're going to see from Microsoft Studios. And I do think it's there. I do think it's going to come. It's just been sort of in fits and starts up until now. And I think we're finally going to get to see it on a, a more regular cadence, hopefully over the next couple of years. So once that becomes a bigger, you know, quality in the er, in the marketplace, I think that's going to start to shift potentially for them but i I think we're a few years off from that so long as their games keep selling if they continue to you know if sony continues to put out nines and tens and game of the year consideration games that are selling 10 plus million copies in their first year year and a half two years they'll probably push that off as long as they can um i it's a thing for me where i'm i i think it's an inevitability but i also do think we are seeing somewhat of the the negatives of the streaming service uh, subscription model on the entertainment side. And I don't know if it'll happen on the game side, but like to the point of Netflix, they became a sort of, you know, staple expectation of everyone's entertainment lives. But we're now seeing a really weird time for Netflix where they have this perception of canceling all their shows too quickly because they're not getting the incredible enough eyeballs and the demand Mm. that a larger subscription service needs. And so that's also going to be an interesting thing to see if, OK, well, if the, the bar of measurement isn't how many people bought this game in the first year, is it how many people played 10 plus hours in the first weekend or 50 plus hours in the first month? You know, we might see metric uh, levels of success change and that could affect the way games get produced. There's a, I think there's a lot of unknown still for where we go with subscription services in general. Well, there are certainly some really big questions left about uh, the changes to PlayStation Plus. Probably the biggest question mark is what are these game libraries actually going to consist of? Hopefully we'll find out sooner than later. Jonathan, it's planned to launch in June. Is that right? June is the case. Yeah, we still will have normal PS Plus for the next couple months. All right. Exciting times ahead. Uh, Before we go, we have the results of last episode's poll. We wanted to know which next-gen sci-fi game are you looking forward to most? We're 
talking about five big upcoming next-gen sci-fi games. And perhaps unsurprisingly, Ryan Starfield uh, came at the top of the list. Uh, top of the list was just over 45% of the vote. It is beating out big names like uh, Star Wars and, and Mass Effect and Outer Worlds too. So I don't know, Ryan, I, I know it's like one of the most anticipated games of the year, but are you surprised to see it coming in on top? No, because it's it's got two things going for it. Uh, mm-hmm. And both, they're, they're, neither is at the expense of the other, but it is it is the next Todd Howard uh, studio game, the next Todd Howard team game, uh, which mm-hmm. so that alone lends it plenty of hype and, and credibility. But it's also the only one on our poll that we talked about that's even close sure. to coming out. So it, it has, <laughs> that's true. It has the, the benefit of, of actually being a real thing that's on the horizon going forward as well. So those two things together mean I'm not surprised at all by the poll result. That's true. Uh, 11-11-22 this year, uh, release date for Starfield. Hopefully it doesn't get pushed. Breath of the Wild 2 just got pushed. We'll see. Uh, poll for you for next episode. We want to know which gaming subscription service are you most interested in? Xbox Game Pass, PlayStation Plus, Nintendo Switch Online, or maybe a combination of, of two or more. Make sure to vote at IGN.com. We'll share the results with you next week. And that will do it for this edition of Next Gen Console Watch. Uh, thank you to both Jonathan and Ryan. Thank you to Alan working behind the scenes to make this episode possible. We'll be back next Friday. 6 a.m. Pacific, 9 a.m. Eastern with more PlayStation 5 and Xbox Series X news. We'll see you then.